Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Shamini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. I'm joined today by Loretta Napoleoni. She's the author of Merchant of Men, How Jihadists and ISIS Turned Kidnapping and Refugee Trafficking into a Multi-Billion Dollar Business. Much of that money is going to ISIS. And I thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. So, uh, Loretta, uh, in segment one, we were talking about how kidnappings and ransom money generates uh, resources for ISIS to continue their war. Uh, now, combined with that activity, we have uh, refugee smuggling mm -hmm. that is also going on, and we have drug trafficking going on. So tell us about these two additional components that has now really created a multi-billion dollar uh, business, as you say in the book? Well, I would say that we start with uh, drug trafficking because that's really the beginning of the story. It happened after 9-11, the introduction of the Patriot Act, which disrupted completely the money laundering activities uh, of you know, drug trafficking. But also, because of that, it disrupted the flows. So until 9-11, you would have um, cocaine from Colombia going via the U.S. and then into Europe. But then, you know, you couldn't do after 9-11. What is it in the Patriot Act that disrupted it? Well, what, distract, what disrupted the whole thing is that uh, the financial section of the Patriot Act uh, allows the U.S. monetary authorities to monitor any dollar transaction taking place anywhere in the world. So that really is the issue that mostly affected money laundering because, of course, in the old days, uh, you would have had the U.S. being a transshipment point uh, to Europe for cocaine, but also the place where you would launder the money. That was not possible anymore. Mm. So, in, so they had to find another way, and that way was using the euro, which, of course, in 2001 had just come uh, on the market. So the money laundering started to be done in Europe, uh, but at that time also the U.S. was not attractive anymore as a transshipment country. So why going via the U.S. if the money laundering is done in Europe by the European organized crime, in particular the Italian, the Ndrangheta? So they had to find another route, and that route was uh, from Venezuela into West Africa through the Sahel. The Sahel is that region uh, that is, you know, below basically the Sahara Desert, uh, and it goes uh, from West Africa to East Africa. Why Venezuela? Well, Venezuela, be because at that time Chavez uh, had been uh, quite welcoming to the cartel uh, to use Venezuela as a transshipment point. Uh, um, so there was a certain... I'm sure that you've been challenged on that particular uh, notion oh, that Chavez uh, was welcome. Oh, absolutely. Mm. I've been challenged many times. But the cartel, what the cartel did uh, was opening up. It was not Chavez that invited the cartel. It was the cartel <laughs> that infiltrated, of course, the regime of, of Chavez. Um, so y you can see that from 2001 onwards, uh, there's also been a shifting... Uh, uh, this yeah. assumption here, I should just uh, air he right here, that I actually worked for President Chavez in Miraflores for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So where um, is it, what evidence do you have that that was actually taking place? Well, we do, we, the, the, evidence, the, the evidence that we have is that uh, a lot of plantation was moved uh, uh, th through the border from Colombia to Venezuela. There was also a lot of transformation of the product, so the actual production of cocaine, they moved to Venezuela. Then the small planes, uh, so that's what they use. They use small planes uh, to land in Guinea-Bissau. So a small plane cannot fly from Colombia all the way to Guinea-Bissau. It had to fly from Venezuela because that's the distance. Um, the other evidence, of course, is the settling in um, Guinea-Bissau of the cartel headquarters, uh, say, for the transshipment. So it had to come from Venezuela. And the Chavez government uh, knew that, that it was coming from Venezuela. Now, why didn't they do anything about that? Uh, I have no idea. Um, I don't think that Chavez was uh, involved directly, but for sure his government uh, 
is the government that was in power when this shift took place. That's interesting. All right, let's continue. We are now in Guinea-Bissau. So from uh, uh, so Guinea-Bissau, what the cartel did was um, uh, basically buy Guinea-Bissau. Guinea-Bissau was uh, an ideal country because uh, it, it was a colony of um, uh, Portugal. He had lots of uh, small airstrips uh, in the middle of the jungle, in this sort of archipelago. Uh, so it was easy for this small plane to land. Also, it used to be a very important fishing uh, um, uh, country. Um, so they had uh, massive warehouses uh, uh, where they could store the cocaine. Of course, you know, the fishing had stopped because uh, of difficulties in fishing, I mean, there's massive ore fishing in West Africa, so a lot of the industry has been completely destroyed. So it was the ideal location. Now the key, once um, they got to Guinea-Bissau, was you know how we're going to get to Europe. Um, so the idea was to use boats, of course, to also use planes. But when they got there, they discovered that there was a network. Uh, of smuggling, they went from West Africa all the way to Algeria and Libya. They used to smuggle cigarettes uh, and other, you know, key products that were cheaper in uh, Libya or in um, Algeria, and they could sell uh, in West Africa. And this network was run by former Mujahideen. So people that come back from the anti-Soviet jihad, uh, mostly they were Algerians, they have been um, kicked out of Algeria by the coup in the 1990s. So they ended up becoming smugglers in the Sahara, in the South Sahara along the Sahel. So these people could carry the cocaine along the same smuggling route that they were using to, to bring cigarettes. So this yeah, is how Cigarettes it started. and designer purses yes. and all those sorts of things that you see yes. in the streets of Italy or Venice or so yes. on. And so they, you're saying now we have these expanded uh, routes that are now smuggling in cocaine. Yes, so this was uh, a welcoming business, let's say, for that kind of smuggler community stroke jihadist. I mean, th these people had started their career being jihadists and mujahideen, but then, you know, of course, they survived by you know, being criminals, I mean, smuggling. So a group of them in 2003 decided to branch off uh, into another business, and this business was kidnapping. Uh, so they thought, you know, why don't we have a go and kidnapping foreigners? Uh, um, we have the network, meaning, you know, we control the territory. We have the camps where we can keep them. And so they did. Um, so they kidnapped 32 Europeans. Uh, and with the ransom money, which was about 6 million euros that they got, they founded uh, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. So Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb uh, was born out of, you know, the Kogé business and the kidnapping business. It has nothing to do with the uh, traditional Al-Qaeda. It didn't get money from traditional Al-Qaeda. It just took the name because, you know, the name at that time was the best possible brand. But this is what started a new business. Then all of a sudden, uh, uh, all the jihadis, and in particular, of course, you know, uh, the Al-Qaeda, the traditional Al-Qaeda, at that time was run still by bin Laden and al-Zwahiri, they thought, wow, this is a good way to fund the group. So they encouraged other jihadists to do exactly the same thing. And this is how kidnapping When does it really so. flourish into a full-fledged business that's supporting the IS, ISIS? Well, I, so, so what happened was 2003 started uh, in West Africa. It was then taken by the pirates, uh, although the piracy model is a little bit different because you need large investments. So you have people who invest in the business of hijacking and kidnapping, and they get a big return. Um, but the, the model is the same. Um, and this took place, uh, on, I would say, from 2008, nine until 2013. Um, this is when it really flared in piracy. And then 
the same model we see in Syria, and really it's, it took place in Syria from 2011 onwards. And this is when the civil war started, so we see kidnapping becoming a, a good source of revenues, not only for the government, uh, because uh, they start kidnapping rich Syrians in order to bankroll the, the war, um, but also by various jihadist groups. The jihadist group did not kidnap the Syrians, they kidnapped the foreigners. Uh, and there were plenty of foreigners because there were um, journalists, there were aid workers, uh, and then you know, there were all those different people that wanted to become journalists or aid workers or the freelancers. Um, and, and this is when the business really started to take off. I would say that the peak of the business possibly was between 2013 and 2014. And, things and how does the currency play into all of this? You, uh, we were speaking mm. offline that, you know, euros are available in Syria, people yeah. can transact with the euros and they can spend the money locally um, yes. as well. Um, what, is the ICE, what does ISIS do with the money and how is it spent locally? Well, I mean, the, the Islamic State, we, we, we must uh, understand one thing, that the Islamic State did not buy the hostages for money. Um, they actually bought the hostages for political reasons. So they bought the hostages was a form of investment uh, um, because they wanted to use them as they did politically, so the beheading. But of course, uh, this applied only to the US citizen and to the American citizen. Um, the others, uh, they used them uh, in order to make money. Uh, then all of a sudden even the Japanese became political and this is when the Prime Minister pledged uh, 200 million in aid to you know, the cause of fighting um, the, the jihadists in, in Syria. So it is important to understand that while a group like al-Nusra um, did kidnap people only for the money, the Islamic State use them for political reason and whatever whoever they could not use for political reason then they exchanged for money um so the idea was not this is a form of funding when you're saying for political reasons it's well for, for beheading basically for beheading i mean which yeah. gets a lot more social media hits and people's Absolute, attention yes. and helps their recruitment and helps that yeah. they can stand up to yeah so powers. so i would say that the difference between this model is that you know for al-qaeda in the maghreb the pirates and also for al nusra um the kidnapping was only a business for the islamic state was an investment which could become a business. And that's fundamental because that shows also how clever they are. I mean, they know that kidnapping is a short-lived business because at the end of the day, you know that if you kidnap tourists going to Timbuktu on holiday, um, at a certain point people will not go there on holiday anymore. A much better business, a long-term business, is actually trafficking people because here we are in highly, highly destabilized areas of the world, and the number of people that want to leave these areas is increasing. Now, that is a good business. If you tax every single um, refugee that is uh, brought across your borders, uh, and that's what the Islamic State did, then, then you talk about good money, steady business, long-term business. Let's continue our discussion in the next segment about the people smuggling business. Thank you so much for joining us with Loretta Napoleoni right here in our Baltimore studios. Mm -hmm.